Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. I hope everyone's week is going great. Welcome to another Encore study group. This time we are going to be talking about wireless LAN design principles. So if you've spent a lot of time looking at wired design, then that's great. But we have to tell, think of, through a lot of different uh, ideas when we're looking at actually designing wireless networks as well. So we're going to be talking about a whole lot of things. Let's just pop up the agenda here. So we've got autonomous access points to look at, not used a whole lot these days, but at the same time, we do still use them in some places. So we need to understand how those work. And, you know, I often say too, when looking at spanning tree and a couple of other protocols that sometimes it helps to know where we came from in order to understand why we are where we are. And so we'll take a look at autonomous access points. We've got lightweight access points to talk about. That's really how we design our networks these days. Um, then we have wireless LAN controllers and access points. So where do we actually deploy wireless LAN controllers and where do we actually deploy access points? And that's a very important part of any kind of design, you know, wireless design methodology. And then lastly, I think we'll have time for this. Uh, we want to talk about location services. So uh, these days there's a lot of reasons to track wireless assets, whether it's people who are carrying wireless devices like phones in their pockets or whether it's actual RFID tags and such. So we're gonna be talking about location services here at the end. Now, one quick thing to consider here, or at least one quick announcement. Um, I am going to be taking a small break from these study groups. Hopefully we'll be back within a couple of months, but just got some things that we're trying to kind of sort through and figure out the best way to establish a workflow around um, not just CBT uh, videos, but also YouTube videos. So. Um, long story short, I'm just taking a break until I can figure out how exactly to best figure out or best establish a, a good working rhythm. And then once that's been established, I'm going to come back. So looking forward to seeing everybody, uh, when we get started with that, but here's the good news. We have actually now worked through after today, I suppose we will have worked through the entirety of domain one in the Encore blueprint. And so that's a very good foundational, uh, place to begin. And from here, we'll be looking at domain two, which is that really pretty cool section about virtualization, network virtualization. We did already talk a little bit about some of that because you know Cisco wants us to know about Lisp and VXLAN, and we actually already covered that as part of this. But um, you know, when you're looking at virtualization, do I understand data center virtualization and network virtualization techniques and such? So that'll be domain two, and that's what we will be getting to on the other side of this break. And I'll uh, mention that again at the end of the video for anybody who might join late. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So um, what, 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 what are we starting with here? All right, so autonomous access points. So this is a fun story, actually, I, I suppose, on some level. I actually got my start on in wireless networking. I was a graduate of university with an electrical engineering degree in hand. And all I knew was I took one class on computer networking that I really enjoyed. Um, I mean, this was not a Cisco related class. This is not CCNA. It was simply computer networking. And so I learned the OSI model. I learned Dijkstra's algorithm, not, I mean, yes, related to OSPF, but um, not like how to configure it, more like literally doing Dijkstra's algorithm by hand. I mean, just think about a senior level university course <laughs> about computer networking. It was a lot of fun. I actually had a, a blast learning how the internet worked. Up until then, I thought the internet was one big server somewhere. And to learn like, oh man, it's it's millions of servers, I don't know about millions of servers, but probably you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of servers out there. I had no idea that's how the internet worked until I was 22 years old or so. And so, you know, this is, what was I saying all that? All right, so <laughs> so we uh, I, I happened to there happened to be a local Cisco partner in my area that hired me, and they hired me knowing that they needed help on the wireless side of things. So right away, this is 2005, and hot off the presses was Cisco acquiring a company called Airspace. Airspace had pioneered this concept of lightweight access point design, but up in Till this point, I mean, yeah, that was the hot new technology, but I had to do a whole lot of autonomous access point design and implementation back in 2005 when I was 22 years old. So what is an autonomous access point? So an autonomous access point looks sort of like this. Uh, we are familiar with the concept of maybe an access layer switch. If we have an access layer switch, usually what we're going to see is not a whole lot of layer three happening here, probably some layer two. So we're going to trunk this connection back up to our distribution layer 
And for those who aren't as up to speed on access and distribution layer and trunking and such, we actually did cover this earlier on in the playlist. So be sure to go back in time if you're watching this, especially if you're watching this recorded at this point, um, maybe click back a few videos and watch enterprise networking design concepts. Either way, we're going to be deploying lots of different VLANs. So let's say we're extending VLANs 20, you know, we, rather than a dash, we'll say 20, 30. I don't know why I started with 20 as I was right. 10, 20, and 30. And what we're going to do is usually we're going to connect clients in on these different VLANs. So maybe I'll have a wired connection coming in, and this will be on VLAN 10. I'll have a couple of other wired connections. These can be on 20 and 30. And then all of these traffics or the traffic uh, packets that are coming in from these different devices are going to get forward upstream on the trunk and they'll be tagged with their particular VLAN IDs. And so we're comfortable with this concept. This is in the wired world. It's very similarly to this is how an autonomous access point behaves. So an autonomous access point is going to behave <laughs> almost very, very similarly. In fact, we're going to have, let's say we're trunking the same VLANs, 10, 20, and 30. The difference is that when I have my clients trying to attach to a wireless access point, the wireless access point, <clears throat> we can't simply assign, like on the switching side, we say this port, for example, is in VLAN 30. And that doesn't fly with access points because we don't have physical ports. So how are we determining which clients go into which VLANs? And this is typically going to be an SSID conversation, a service set identifier. So if you've been studying networking for a while, you're probably com comfortable with what an SSID is, but if you're just getting started, I know when I configure my wireless, I'm looking at my wireless access point over there, uh, I've set a network name. A lot of times the wireless device that I'm configuring wants to call it a network name. Sometimes in parentheses, they'll say SSID. But when I go to scan my wireless network or, or for my wireless network, then all the names show up and usually I get my access point uh, SSID plus the guest version that I have on there plus like my neighbors all the way around me. So I've get like five or six of these and each one of those is a different SSID. Well, you know, I guess I just mentioned I've got one access point communicating a my SSID and a guest. And so we can actually have multiple SSIDs on a single access point. Uh, that's pretty typical, especially in the enterprise space. As a result, I can have different clients connecting on different SSIDs. So maybe this could be, uh, maybe this is a phone actually, I've got drawn as a laptop, but it's connecting on the voice SSID. Um, then I've got one for my, uh, just my clients, my users, my data SSID or what have you. And then maybe I've got one for guests. And the access point is going to map each one of these SSIDs to a particular VLAN. So in our case, voice might be VLAN 10, data might be VLAN 20, and guest could be VLAN 30. And so again, what we're going to do is we're gonna receive that traffic and we're going to send it upstream on the trunk and we'll tag it appropriately. So an access point is gonna look very similar to a switch. Now, one other way that it's very similar is this idea of IP management. Because if we look at an access layer switch, <clears throat> in most cases, I mean, we're not gonna have a dedicated management connection. A lot of our networking devices actually do have dedicated management ports these days, but in most situations, rather than running a completely separate connection and connecting in and managing the, uh, the switch that way, instead what we're going to do is we're going to spin up a layer three interface on one of these VLANs. And so I might spin up a VLAN 10 interface and I call this a switched virtual interface or an SVI. And so if I want to manage the switch, I, um, you know, maybe I'm somewhere on the network, I route through the layer three network and I'm routing towards this VLAN 10 IP address. Well, that's going to go to the layer three gateway for VLAN 10, the VLAN 10 will forward that down and I'll be able to communicate with the SVI for that particular access switch. Well, an access point has the exact same concept. The difference is that we don't call it an SVI, we call it a bridged virtual interface or a BVI. And so same thing though, we're going to map it to a VLAN. So it's on VLAN 10 maybe in this case. And now I can communicate via the same idea through the layer three network coming in on VLAN 10 and managing it. I don't know why I chose VLAN 10 because VLAN 10 is our voice network. Apparently that's also in this network design how we're managing our network devices. That is not advised, but 
you know, so it is. Um, probably I should have put it on VLAN 10, 20 or maybe even like a VLAN 40 that would be explicitly used for management. That would have been a better idea. So that's all. This is, this is the anatomy of an autonomous access point. And it looks very, very similar to a layer two access switch. Here's, and this works, this works great. There's nothing wrong with this. Here's why autonomous access points fell out of favor. It's because when we look at it, we've got, um, we, how many of these access points do we have in our network? You know, I mean, some of us, maybe we have a small organization, maybe we have 10 of these access points in our network, or maybe we have 10 access points in one building and we have a bunch of buildings and maybe we have a hundred access points, but I can tell you that I, I have, I've worked for organizations that have hundreds of access points, if not thousands of access points. And so we might find that we're in the thousands of access point range. I mean, think about really, truly think about a company like Cisco. They've got offices worldwide. They've got tiny, like not just major headquarters offices, but they've got smaller regional offices. I know like where I live, I mean, I've got, I think three different Cisco offices. They're all about three hours away. But, you know, I mean, that's just one little corner of the United States. And so they've got offices all over the place with a bunch of access points. I mean, they probably truly have tens of thousands, if not over 100,000 access points in their environment. And so if I'm going to manage all of those access points via this one IP address, and I've got to put my own configuration on here, and, and also, by the way, keep the software up to date, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just too much. Access points, well, we have a lot more access points than any other network device simply because they we deploy them everywhere. So even access switches, we can have a lot of access switches on our network, but it doesn't compare to how many wireless access points we're going to end up having. So Cisco did what they could around this. Um, they, they created something they called the Wireless LAN Solutions Engine. Uh, or we'll see I, is how we, that's how I pronounced it. I think a bunch of other engineers I knew did. I don't know if anybody else in the world did, but we called that the we'll see. Um, and then the will sum, W L S M. Uh, the will, it was basically just a will see that plugged into a 6,500 chassis. And so the, this engine, the idea of this is that, um, I, as my network admin, I would log into the W S L E W L S. This is why I just call it the will see. And I log into the will see and it uh, pushes, you know, I'll, I'll be like, hey, I want all my access points to have an SSID called voice. I want it to be on VLAN 10 and it'll push it all out. And that's well and good, except back in those days, we didn't have network programmability concepts. We didn't have NetConf and REST APIs and such. And so really what this was doing was it was pushing down CLI commands and I don't know what your experience is with this, but um, when you push CLI commands out, you end up having a lot of issues. <laughs> Maybe the issue is that the password is wrong and so you can't actually log into the device and so it doesn't take. Maybe the problem is that it's running a slightly different version of code and so the CLI command is different. Um, a big problem that we had with the autonomous access points is that they were all able to be configured in one of two ways. We could actually configure them via the CLI, but we could also configure them via an HTTP interface. And I've never heard the story of why Cisco really embraced HTTP interfaces with the access points. I'm not sure why they cared uh, to do that versus, you know, for years people wanted that for switches and never got it. And then when they finally did try, it was, they were awful. Uh, this access, like, again, I, I'm 22 years old. I've never touched a CLI in my life. I mean, I relied heavily on the HTTP interface to configure all of my deployments. Um, it took me a while to get to one where I was deploying truly like 100 access points and I had all these access points stacked up on my desk. And I was like, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> and that's when I learned, okay, you know what? Um, I'd already been learning how to do CLI on switches. It's time to embrace the CLI on these access points. But the problem is that these HTTP interfaces were just making a CLI changes, if I could speak. The HTTP interfaces were really just making CLI commands on the back end, just like the will see was. And so what you end up with is you have a bunch of different input types because now the HTTP interface has made CLI changes and maybe I've logged into the CLI directly and made some changes. Maybe will see has tried to make some changes. 
And so you might think that you know how to deploy an SSID, but what if it tries to push that SSID out and there's like a legacy configuration out there that impedes us from going out there and you know, maybe what I used to doing is configuring an SSID and when I put that in and the SSID already exists, there's an error. And so this is, you know, you scale this out to thousands of access points on this archaic way of doing it. And at this point in 2021, it's archaic to, uh, to push direct CLI commands. We had a lot of problems with this. It just was not ideal. So uh, management continued to be difficult even with us trying to create these wireless controllers, so to speak, with Wilsey and Wilsum. Wilson? I don't know. I, uh, you tell me. Is that how you pronounced it for those who were around back then? I don't know. So, moving on to our next topic is the world of lightweight. Uh, lightweight. I'll just write that out because I can't write. When there's that many G's and H's and E's and I's in a word, I, I can't do that and talk at the same time. So, the idea of the lightweight access point. So, I already mentioned this that in 2005, Cisco acquired a company called Airspace. That was that was like Airspace with an E. And so it's interesting because Cisco truly in 2020 finally moved away from AirOS because a lot of their all their wireless LAN controllers were running the original operating system that they acquired from this company 15 plus years ago. <laughs> They're finally running on iOS XE, which is which is interesting. That's with the Catalyst 9800s. But AirOS for years and years, this is what we were running our wireless LAN controllers on. And because you know, AirOS was a pioneer in the space of this lightweight architecture. So Airspace, as of again, 2003, 2004 timeframe, they were coming after Cisco. They were competing with Cisco in the wireless space and so it was making life difficult on Cisco when they realized, you know, if you can't beat them, acquire them, which is kind of how Cisco tends to operate as well as a lot of tech companies. And so they acquired Airspace. It became the, boy, oh boy, um, this is stretching a little bit. I believe, I remember the 44, the 4402, the 4404 controller, I think. Boy, it has been so long. I think that's what those, those were, were the 4400s. Um, and so we had these controller, different wireless LAN controllers. We also had like a 210 something, 2106 maybe. I, I can't remember. 2006. Oh, it's been so long. I can't remember what those models were anymore. <laughs> but we had these wireless LAN controllers that Cisco acquired from Airspace. And so here's the idea of a lightweight access point. The idea of a lightweight access point is you have this wireless LAN controller. We call these the WLCs. And this is going to look very familiar because of what we just talked about with the wireless LAN solutions engine. Um, we are going to, as the network admins, log in to these wireless LAN controllers, and we're going to, uh, you know, it's going to push the configuration out to these lightweight access points. So why are we calling them lightweight access points? Well, we're calling them lightweight access points because it's actually impossible for me to log in and configure them. That we all. These lightweight access points are very lightweight. They, they don't have a lot of intelligence that the autonomous access points have to have. So their software packages are a lot smaller, for example. And meanwhile, all of the control information, all the, the entire control plane, so to speak, is being pushed down to them from this wireless LAN controller. In a weird way, this is a very early form of software-defined networking. It's the idea that we have offloaded all of the intelligence of our devices to some centralized controller. And so I'm interfacing with the controller, usually via a GUI, a graphical user interface of some kind, which at the time was HTTP interfaces um, or an HTTP interface. And so, I mean, it, in a lot of ways it was, but instead of running again, NetConf and REST APIs and such, we were running a protocol that we called the Lightweight Access Point Protocol or LWAP. Now it took a few years, but eventually the industry decided that they thought that that was really cool and they need a standardized version of that. And, and that's what we call the, oh shoot, that's right. Control and provisioning of wireless access points or CAPWAP tunnel. Uh, see, by the time CAPWAP came around, it was probably 2008, 2009. I'm not exactly sure when, but I was doing a lot more routing and switching. I had actually diverted from wireless and 
well, my focus had changed. And so I didn't see a whole lot of cap WAP from, you know, my configuration days. I, I remember a lot of LWAP configuration, for example. And ultimately it's the same technology, but what it is, is it's not just a control information protocol. This is an actual tunnel. We are now tunneling all of our access point control or all of our access point traffic from the access point to the wireless LAN controller. That means when client traffic or a client attaches to this access point, it's going to send a packet. And even though we're connected to uh, a switch here and maybe another switch, and maybe my maybe I'm actually trying to get to this device, let's say this is a wired device here. Um, what's gonna happen is that traffic flow, let me change colors just so it's clear, is gonna get tunneled via CapWeb. So this is, this is what we call a CapWeb tunnel. And my packet's going to go up and up, but not down, even though it looks like it should go down. It's going to go up to the wireless LAN controller. It's going to get de-encapsulated at that point, and now the wireless LAN controller is going to spit it out onto the network. So this is the actual flow. I'll add an arrow there for clarity. This is the actual flow of the network traffic. We see it's going to hit the wireless LAN controller first and then get sent down to the uh, remote client. This has quite a few benefits, actually. At first, it looks like it's an inefficient way of, um, of moving traffic through the network, but we have quite a few advantages here. First of all, all of the network traffic on the wireless network gets seen by the wireless LAN controller. Um, that, that means that it can tell what kind of network traffic is going through the network. It can tell, um, it can get glean a lot of information from it. Uh, second of all, all of the control information, we'll call it control plane traffic, really it's it's, it's less control plane because control plane is more how to forward the packets. It's more just the wireless, like how is the Wi-Fi doing? How you know, is the signal strength good, right? Like is this client able to attach well? It, are, are they too far away? Can we boost the radio? How is interference looking? All of that control information is getting sent up to the wireless lane controller and the wireless LAN controller now has a very holistic view of what our wireless domain looks like. Think back to um, think back to autonomous. If I've got a building and I've got autonomous access points everywhere like this, and maybe one of them, I don't know, let's just say that they're all overlapping. This, this is the range of the wireless signal. And I don't know, like one of our clients who's kind of on the fringe here is is having some problems connecting here. I'll draw it differently. They're having problems connecting to this access point and that access point actually has the ability to boost its radio signal. With a wireless LAN controller, it'll happen automatically. But with us, you know, as network admins, we'd have to log in and figure out, okay, what's going on? Uh, know which access point, which, which access point are you even connecting to? I'd have to log into maybe three different access points, find the client list, know, okay, now you're on this access point. Oh, this access point has you know, a smaller radio range, so it's, it's turned down, let's turn that up. But the question is, if I turn that up and so now the range looks like that, am I interfering with the other access points a little bit too much? Uh, and what what's that do from a channel selection perspective? And so <laughs> it, it becomes a domino effect. You know, managing a wireless environment via autonomous, it, it goes beyond just the sheer number of access points I have to manage, it's also, how I'm managing the wireless signal strengths and the channels and self-healing, by the way, is really cool. So if I deployed enough access points in here that if one of the access points were to go down, I could boost the signal. Maybe all of these access points are at 50% strength. And now I, you know, one of these access points goes down. Can I boost this access point and this access point to cover that range? And if I can, then great, but I'd have to log into those from an autonomous and do it myself. And whereas the wireless LAN controller having its holistic view might say, ooh, uh, that access point just went down. I know that these two access points are nearby. I'm going to simply boost the wireless traffic or the wireless signal strength if I can. If we deploy all of our access points at 100% signal strength, then there's nothing we can do in that situation. But if we have deployed at smaller signal strength so that we can boost on an as needed basis, well, then we have that capability. Whew. Okay. So th those are some key advantages to wireless LAN controllers. Um, here's one other one, by the way. I'm gonna just start a new drawing for this. Okay, this is an important concept. We have layer two versus layer three roaming. Okay, layer two roaming, this is good, 
and easy. Layer three roaming is harder. Okay, here's the idea. What if I have, in within a same building, let's say I have a layer three distribution access design. So now these are layer three links. I use my dots to represent layer three links. And so I've got an access point here. Whoops, that's not an access point. There, access point. Um, this access point is talking out, I don't know, whatever SSID this is, this is going to be on VLAN uh, 20. And then this access point over here, because it's a separate layer three domain, well, technically I should call it layer two, sorry. Because it's a separate layer two domain, I could use VLAN 20. For the sake of clarity, I'll just call it VLAN 30. Because either way, it's a separate broadcast domain. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm roaming like, or I'm, I'm broadcasting out. So if I have a client now that's attached to this access point on the left and I roam over here, my IP address, which is in the, let's just call it 10.10.20, the 20 being the VLAN ID, um, dot X, whatever my IP address is. Well, now I'm attaching to VLAN 30 and I, uh, I don't know, maybe my IP address is gonna be 10.10.30. something. Okay, that's a problem. That, that's hard because now, let's say I'm in the middle of a phone call with somebody, we're communicating back and forth and my IP address just changed. That's a problem. That makes it very difficult. Now Cisco, you know, they've, they had some techniques and such to deal with this. We still have to deal with this, by the way, in some environments, but usually, um, usually this isn't ideal because I don't wanna to have to change my IP address. The only other option is something like this where now I'm attached here. So now I'm on VLAN 30, except this access point knows to connect me back to this access point and then my traffic, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll draw it like that. It, it goes out towards the same location. We can do that. That's that's kind of ugly. It involves additional tunneling mechanisms potentially. It's it's got to have its own own control plane to track all of this information, and so it just layer three roams are hard. It, we we don't like them. Um, I mean, certainly if, if we just said, hey, sorry, if you roam to a new domain, then you're just your your connection is going to reset. And unless you're on a voice call, maybe our clients don't notice. And, and this isn't a problem, by the way, if this is in, I don't know, building one and this over here is in building two, because maybe I stepped outside and I'm walking from building to building. And if my voice call uh, drops for whatever reason, I, I might expect that because I'm just truly walking between locations or potentially even driving between locations. Maybe my expectation is I would never be able to roam, but it limits my designs because now you know, we talked again, we talked about layer two versus layer three to the access layer, to the edge. And if so, if I'm building my wireless domain I, or my, my wired network rather, and I decide, hey, I want a layer three to the edge design, wireless has a way of um, impeding that potentially. Um, and furthermore, simply scaling out, right? Because this might be um, building one on a different floor. Maybe this is floor two and this is floor one. And so now I have to just worry about number one, possibly roaming through the ceiling. Like maybe I'm just sort of in a dead space on floor one, but there's an access point on floor two right directly above me. And my client decides to roam up to floor two. Uh, so there I just did a layer three roam, just not even walking from floor to floor, but of course I could also walk from floor to floor as well. Whew, okay. So that's layer three roaming. That's, that's potentially bad. Um, as you can imagine, I didn't draw it out, but layer two roaming is going to look a lot better where we actually have layer two links now here, and this is VLAN 20 as well. And so now we've got VLAN 20 to VLAN 20, and my IP address doesn't change. I, I'm still happy to be on 10.10.20, uh, that subnet. So layer two roam pretty much takes care of all of that for us. So here's what, <laughs> why am I, why are we going through this? Well, first of all, there is some level of design elements that we need to understand here uh, from a wireless perspective. But then we also have the idea of CapWAP again. So what I do? Oh, I see. Not that. There. So the idea of CapWAP, as I remember, I have a wireless LAN controller that's somewhere in the network. It's attached usually. You know what? Let me just do this like this. Hold up. All right, so let's say this is our distribution layer switch. And then I have the wireless LAN controller hanging off of it. 
now I could have layer three connections down to my edge. Do, 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 do. And then the access points are hanging off of the access or after yeah, off of the access switches. Access points hanging off of the access switches. And this is the exact same design that we just talked about in the last uh, drawing. And we saw that as we, bleh, oh my goodness, I'm so tongue tied today. So we saw that as we roam from one access point to the other, that remember we had to change IP addresses because we're on this 10.10.20.x and this is on VLAN 20. And this again could be VLAN 20, but it would have a different um, subnet range. Maybe this was 10.20.20.x because it's in a different building or floor or something like that. So either way, that's bad. But now we think about the fact that we are using CapWap. So remember what we said, this access point is going to form a tunneled connection to the wireless LAN controller. And as is, by the way, this access point. So when we look at this roaming process from a CapWet perspective, this traffic is actually not belonging to, um, wait, uh, let me think about how to say this because we've got, we still got multiple SSIDs. One thing I didn't, I, I probably should have explained this earlier as well. Um, that concept of SSID to VLAN mappings is no longer done by the uh, lightweight access point. Okay, This lightweight access point is going to take this traffic and put it into the CapWAP tunnel. This Usually, this connection, remember how that connection in an autonomous world needs to be a trunk? In a lightweight access point model, this is typically an access layer connection meaning that it's just on a VLAN. Maybe whatever our management VLAN is, is usually what these access points are going to be on. So maybe this is on VLAN access 50. And so we're, this access point just communicates on VLAN 50. And it uses VLAN 50 to form the CapWAP tunnel. But that's not to say we can't have multiple SSIDs because the SSIDs are defined up here. We might have SSID 1 mapped to VLAN 20 and SSID 2 mapped to VLAN 30. And same thing with SSID 3, we'll just map that to 40. So now we've got the three different SSIDs, we've got the three different VLANs, but they all live on the wireless LAN controller, which means that if this is a layer two trunked connection to the distribution switch, which actually incidentally wireless LAN controllers have to be trunked, there are no layer three interfaces <laughs> going to the wireless LAN controller. So we're actually trunking these SSIDs, well I shouldn't say it like that, we're trunking these VLANs up to the distribution switch, which by the way, think about this. Where are these VLANs? Where do these VLANs live? And it's a little, little trivia question. I'm gonna take a drink here while you think about it. Where do those VLANs live in the network? Yeah, I can't talk and drink at the same time either because that makes me dribble. All right, so if you figured it out, they live here at the distribution layer. The VLANs 20, 30, and 40 are getting trunked to the wireless LAN controller, which means that probably because it's a distribution layer switch, that the SVIs for these VLANs actually live here in distribution. What does that mean for us? What that means is when I'm ready to actually forward this traffic, which we started this conversation earlier, but let's go ahead and finish it now. So now we're forwarding this traffic to the wireless access point, the wireless access point has established a CapWAP tunnel to the wireless LAN controller. That traffic is going to get injected into the CapWAP tunnel and it's going to get de-encapsulated here inside the controller. Now the controller has to figure out, okay, this is great. You attached to, I don't know, SSID two, let's say. So you are actually on VLAN 30. Where are you trying to get? Now, if you're trying to get to a wireless client, you know, I, I mean, we, we had very rarely are you communicating wireless client to wireless client, I suppose. But let's just say for the sake of argument that they're trying to get to this client here who also happens to be on VLAN 30. Well, at that point, we would simply encapsulate it into a CapWeb tunnel and send it down to the appropriate access point, at which point it would get sent out towards that client. If, however, it's trying to get to somewhere else on the network, let's say it's trying to get to, I don't know, a device that's attached to that switch that's on a different VLAN, maybe it's on VLAN 40. Well, how do we route from VLAN 30 to VLAN 40? We have to go through the SVI. And so 
the wireless LAN controller now will de-encapsulate that traffic and send it to the distribution switch. And the distribution switch is going to receive that on VLAN 30 because, you know, I mean, again, chances are if, if we're going off net, off of our subnet, then we're our destination MAC address tells us to go to the default gateway. And so that's why we're forwarding it upstream based on the MAC address to the default gateway, and then it gets routed appropriately. It's going to get routed to VLAN 40, and it's going to get sent down this layer 3 link. Um, you know, this is all well and good. The <laughs> I forgot these are layer 3 links. So just keep in mind that this VLAN 40 is different than that VLAN 40. Uh, this is where we get a little bit confused. Uh, we can get confusing with our different layer 2 domains. But because these are layer 3 links, either way, it's a different subnet, and everything I said applies. We're going to forward the traffic to SVI for VLAN 30. It's going to get routed, not necessarily to VLAN 40 in this case. It will get routed down to the uh, access switch at that point, which will then figure out, oh, I've got a local SVI for that VLAN, and it'll send it down to the, uh, to the host. Okay. Um... I hope that was clear. I, I didn't say it yet, but absolutely, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, I know that this this took a little bit of a, it took a couple of unexpected turns, even from my perspective. I uh, So I apologize if it didn't quite come out clearly, but um, if you're watching this live, chime in with the chat or chime in to the chat and we will uh, answer the questions as best we can. Uh, I'm, I'm here in the chat, even if you're watching this, live. It's not actually live. It's been pre-recorded. So I'm answering questions as they come in. Meanwhile, if you're watching this after the fact, then please feel free to post YouTube comments. I always try to get back to them and answer any questions that you might have uh, as best I can. So, um, but that said, just keep in mind in all of this, the magic of the autonomous, uh, of the lightweight access points is this CapWAP concept. I am now tunneling my traffic to the wireless LAN controller by default. I say by default because we actually can configure it not to do that, but a lot of the advantages of CapWeb that we talked about, having all of the control information and all of that, uh, there's a very big reason why we, and oh, and not, not the least of which, by the way, is the scenario we just described, which is now we've got layer two roams everywhere. Did we actually talk about that? Yes, we did. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, this idea, so yeah, if I roam over here now to this access point, chances are we've got, or we've, we've got these same SSIDs that are on all of the access points. Um, so anyways, uh, hopefully that's all coming out clear. We've got SSID two, long story short, on both of those access points, broadcasting the same VLAN 30, even though there's layer three segmentation. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time because I wanna make sure that's clear. And uh, that was why we originally set out on this conversation. If we have layer three segmentation, between our access points, because we're tunneling our access points to the controller, we're essentially joined to the layer two domain that the wireless LAN controller is attached to. So therefore, when I roam from one access point to the other, I don't actually roam between two different layer two domains. I stay within the same layer two domain that exists at the wireless LAN controller. So all my traffic gets tunneled up to the wireless LAN controller and back down. So it preserves layer two roams, even in layer three environments. So set it two or three times there. Hopefully, hopefully it all makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. So again, any questions, uh, feel free to ask. This is a little bit complicated, but it's not too bad once you get used to it either. I don't want you to be afraid of it. All right, so next we are gonna be talking about, oh yeah, wireless LAN controller deployment. So the question is, where are we gonna put these wireless LAN controllers? Because we just made a pretty big claim, and that's that if I have a distribution layer uh, at, at a, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's my headquarters location. I've got a distribution layer there, and I attach my wireless LAN controller to it. Remember what we just said, that since all of my wireless client traffic is getting encapsulated into these CapWAP tunnels, and they're actually getting, oops, they're getting encapsulated and sent to the wireless LAN controller. That means that when my client actually shows up on the network, it shows up here. It shows up as if it's showing, it's as if it's appearing on that distribution layer switch, which is why we said earlier that if we've got, you know, VLANs 20 and 30 and 40 configured, 
that really those are distribution layers, VLANs 20, 30, and 40. So effectively what I'm saying is that all of my wireless clients in my network, regardless of where they are, if they're connecting to this wireless LAN controller, they show up and they live logically at the distribution layer, which means that if I have anything else in the network, let's say a bunch of switches, routers, whatever, and I'm trying to um, get down to these clients, I'm actually going to send all of that traffic to the wireless LAN controller. Um, and then the wireless LAN controller will, uh, will get it to the destination. So if all my clients live where my wireless LAN controller lives, where do I actually want it to live? And we've got some problems here because as we scale our networks out, let me just start a new slide. As we scale our networks out, now we've got a bunch of access layer switches and then maybe a distribution switch. And this is building one. And then we've got another building over here and we've got a distribution layer here with a bunch of access layer switches. This is building two. And then we've got maybe a third building up here. The same thing with a distribution layer switch and a bunch of access switches. And then we've got a core layer that's uniting all of these. So all of these distribution switches are connecting to a core layer. And then we've got, of course, the access points themselves are all connecting in at the access layer. So we've got a bunch of access points, all kinds of access points all over in the network. Where are we to deploy the wireless LAN controllers? Um, there are two primary ways of thinking about this. The first of which is going to be what we call a centralized model. So the centralized model is going to say, let's just deploy two big fat wireless LAN controllers. And I say big and fat, that's because they're gonna be supporting all of the access points. So they have to be big enough, they have to have the licensing. You know, if I've got 100 access points or let's just even say 500 access points in my environment, then for redundancy sake, these should both be licensed and capable of supporting 500 at a time. And I'm just gonna connect them into the core layer. Now, or, or somewhere that's centralized. Deploying them to the core layer, very rarely recommended. And the reason for that is what we said earlier. Remember, wireless clients, if my client down here wirelessly connects to an access point, it's going to show up logically wherever the wireless LAN controller is. Well, that means that really truly what we're saying is that we have our clients logically attached to the core switches. That is not ideal. We do not want our clients logically attached to the core switch. The core switch is simply supposed to do layer three switching really fast among all of our different network blocks. So probably attaching it to the core switch, not the best idea. Uh, so maybe instead of attaching to the core switch, what if we were to still do the centralized model, but now we're just going to connect them in down here to building one, building one's distribution layer. Okay, I mean, that's fine. That gets rid of the core problem. Now we don't have clients attaching at the core, but now even a client attaching at building three here wirelessly is going to logically show up here at building one. So even you know if, if building one, all of their IP addresses start with 10.1, for example, and then I'm on a VLAN or whatever, um, all of our wired clients will be part of the 10.3 dot whatever network because it's at building three, but our wireless clients are gonna be part of the 10.1 dot whatever subnet because again, they show up down here when they do a DHCP request, the DHCP request gets tunneled to the wireless LAN controller. The wireless LAN controller drops it off. And now as far as that distribution switch is concerned, oh, hey, you're on my VLAN 10. And so I'm going to get you a VLAN 10 inter, uh, IP address. And that happens to be 10.1.10.x. And, and that's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. If building one is our is is our headquarters, then maybe we're all okay with that. But we do have to just keep <laughs> some of these consequences in mind. Where we're going to put our wireless LAN controller, uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated if we're going to centralize it. Um, the, the advantage to centralizing it is we've got exactly two controllers, one for redundancy. In fact, Cisco these days, you can you know, have them basically be mirroring each other. Uh, it used to be that you had to have them both configured separately. Uh, so that's cool. You can kind of pair them up now and licensing is, is different in that environment and such. You, uh, there are a, a lot of advantages to centralized. I would 
probably say that in a lot of cases, you we're going to try to centralize it if we can. That said, it might not make sense to centralize. And if that's the case, we can go with the, uh, well, there, we'll just call it the distributed model. I'm not going to just call it that. It is called the distributed model. I'm just going to write it over here. Um, the distributed model. So the distributed model essentially says, I barely got that on the screen, but it counts. The distributed model says, I'm going to now deploy wireless LAN controllers to all of these locations. And that creates a couple of interesting scenarios. So first of all, uh, I'm dealing with a lot more wireless LAN controllers. Okay. So my number of wireless LAN controllers has gone up. Second of all, I've got to decide on redundancy. You know, if, if this wireless LAN controller were to go down, do I want all of my access points that are here? Do I want them, you know, normally they're connecting to this wireless LAN controller. Do I want them to form a connection to a different wireless LAN controller elsewhere? Because if I do, all of my wireless clients are going to change subnets. They're going to change layer two domains in the exact same fashion that we talked about earlier. But if I don't do it that way, well, by golly, do I have to deploy a wireless LAN controller redundantly to every single site? Because that starts to add up, even if they're smaller wireless LAN controllers because of it. And so we've got to figure that out. Um, we got to figure out how to manage them. Now we could have a manager of managers. Cisco at one time had the WCS, which became uh, prime infrastructure, which became ultimately um, DNA center now. Uh, you know, we, we've got a manager of managers that can con uh, configure all of our wireless LAN controllers for us. You know, it's this pyramid concept, right? Remember we had all of the wireless LAN con or uh, wireless access points we had to manage. And then we're like, hey, we could manage them all via wireless LAN controller. That's really great. Um, now we only manage one controller for all of these access points. That sounds really cool. Other than now, we just signed ourselves up to manage maybe another 5, 10 wireless LAN controllers. Uh, that's better than hundreds of access points, but it's still kind of painful to maintain our policy across all 5 to 10 of these wireless LAN controllers. And so this is where you put a software package up here, which again, these days uh, would be Cisco's DNA center that's going to manage all the wireless LAN controllers for us. But, um, you know, so, so that's something we have to consider. We have to consider how to do redundancy, for example. Um, but, you know, in, in some cases, distributed does make a lot of sense. Uh, the biggest problem with distributed really probably comes back to, uh, because we're probably going to have the manager of managers anyways. We're probably going to have DNA center or prime infrastructure or something in our environment. Um, so we're probably going to, really be focused on this concept of redundancy and do I have to deploy two controllers to every location? If I have three, if I have three locations, it's probably not a big deal. If I have 30 locations, I'm spending a whole lot of money on redundant controllers at that point. And the, you have to kind of make that painful decision between the two. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Yeah. Just consider licensing. That's the only other thing in my notes, you know, uh, how we're going to license all of this as well. Uh, we haven't really talked about licensing, but for those who haven't experienced it, usually a controller is licensed to support so many uh, access points that used to be hard coded into the hardware. And so back in my day when I was doing it, if we exceeded, you know, if I had, if I had to support a site with 25 access points, I could deploy a 25 access point controller, except maybe I'd want to deploy two for redundancy. But that was scary because if we were to realize that we needed a 26th access point, then I would have to completely rip those two out and put in two fifties, um, which, yeah, I mean, you could maybe do a 50 and a 25, but if the 50 goes down, then you have to decide which access points go down because uh, we can only support 25 of them. And so that that's how licensing used to work. Nowadays, it's a software license. Yeah, certain hardware types can only support so many access points, but we can usually at least, you know, play it safe. And when we're deploying an access or we deploy a piece of hardware that can support more access points and we license only the number that we have. So that, that can, um, that, that's certainly something that we want to consider. All right. We are, um, actually running out of time uh, a little bit here. I'm not sure if we'll have time to talk about location, but we'll, we'll see if we can knock it out. Uh, the other thing to consider primarily is a cloud deployment. So, this is the first time I've mentioned uh, Meraki. So those who are in the wireless world know a lot about Meraki. That is an I there, Meraki, cloud. There we go. 
the big thing, you know, Cisco acquired Meraki many years ago, and the big thing that Meraki was doing that was unique was this concept of cloud management. They started with wireless because everything I just said about licensing is frankly, it's a horrible design, you know? I mean, the, Cisco, even for like 10 years, they were putting out controllers that are like, here, this is licensed for, you know, 200 access points. And you can, they, they did start to introduce some amount of variable licensing, but it was just this pain point still of like, okay, I, I got 101 access points in my environment. And Cisco's response is, okay, well, you exceed the 100 license, so you'll need the 150, and you'll need two of those for redundancy. So you're licensing 300 access points for 101. Uh, you're, yeah, you're buying 300 licenses for 101 access points, and that's just not efficient. And so Meraki was like, you know, rather than dealing with where the wireless LAN controllers are going to go, and rather than dealing with um, these licensing woes, we'll just put a wireless LAN controller up in the sky, up in the cloud, and these access points are going to connect to the cloud. The advantage of that is we don't have to worry about where it goes. We don't have to worry about the licensing as much. Every access point, you simply buy one license for the access point. And end of story, licensing is super simple. And Meraki was so successful with this model that they started building switches and firewalls and even at one point started working on phones, although that didn't really pan out. Um, they've got cameras now that, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about Meraki is you've got one interface that you're logging into for all of your networking devices. And so Cisco saw the writing on the wall that this was a methodology that it doesn't fit everywhere. Like Cisco didn't see this as the future of networking, but at the same time, it, some organizations really do want this and need this. And so Cisco bought them and they've done a really good job of keeping two separate business models. They're you know, could call it their Cisco side and their Meraki side. Um, and Cisco doesn't care which one you buy, but they understand that they're two very different technology sets. And, you know, maybe it's an emotional decision at that point. Which one are you more comfortable with? The downside to the Meraki model is that now we're back to the autonomous way of thinking, which is that these access points are now sending all of their traffic. We don't want them to send all the client traffic up to the Meraki cloud. That doesn't make any sense. So they're depositing their traffic right onto the switch, which means we're now trunking to the access points, which means we're no longer getting some of the advantages of CapWAP. Um, you know, it's not it's not huge you know, loss because the we're still sending a lot of our um, wireless control information up to the Meraki cloud so they can figure out same kinds of things, right? Like, should we boost signal strength? Should we change channels? Some of these things. That, that's all well and good, but... Um, that it's just something to keep in mind, I suppose, that we, we are going to lose some element of that. Um, and at that point, we've lost our layer two roaming concept. So if if we're doing layer three within this building, for example, because we're not tunneling anymore, we have to deal with layer three roams. Now, layer three roams are a lot easier when you're using a Meraki environment, but it is still something we have to consider. Uh, it'll do kind of some of that anchoring that we talked about earlier, where it send your traffic to a previous access point that you were on and such. Uh, it's just not as clean, ultimately. So that said, a lot of that's, I want to be clear, right? Like you, Meraki has a really good solution. Um, just we're, we're just trying to teach how, think about from a packet perspective, how all of this comes together and the difference between a cloud controller and an on-premise controller. All right, uh, do, 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 do. well, we'll get as far as we can. We're gonna talk about, uh, we'll talk about this really quick. So let's talk about access point design. What do we need to consider when we're designing or, or picking our access points? Usually there's a concept of coverage versus capacity. And I had to do this all day long back in the day, but I'll, I'll just tell you again, back in the day, in 2005, when I was going to a school, like an elementary school, uh, I would go to this elementary school and there'd be, you know, a bunch of classrooms on one side and a bunch of classrooms on another side. And this is not at all what the building plan looked like, but <laughs> uh, let's say this is one part of the building, right? This is like a hallway. And so I would throw an access point up and I would see, okay, how far do we cover? So we maybe cover something like this and okay, good. We're getting the corners of those classrooms. Ooh, we're only about halfway covered in those classrooms, so let's put another access point here. Okay, now we're covered there. We put another access point here, and we cover the entire hallway with three access points, and that was wonderful. 
And so each access point looks like is covering roughly uh, six classrooms. So we have about six classrooms here, six classrooms there. Life is good, right? This is coverage. I'm focused on just making sure the wireless goes everywhere. Uh, back in these days, what would happen is you'd have a mobile cart with a bunch of laptops on it or something like that, and they'd wheel that cart into a classroom. And so they'd give all the kids a laptop and those kids would do an exercise and then they'd you know, take that, that card out and they'd bring it to the next classroom. And that was essentially what we were doing in, again, the mid 2000s, late 2000s. Fast forward to today. <laughs> what's happening here? Well, what's happening is we have this exact same situation, except in every one of these classrooms, what we have is we have 30 students and those 30 students, you don't know what I'm going to say, those, they have 30 different devices. In fact, they might have 60 different devices. Maybe we're talking about high school, right? And so every one of those students has a personal cell phone in their pockets that they're going to want on the Wi-Fi, but then they also have a Chromebook or an iPad or some other device that they're going to use for the actual schooling. And so all of this needs to work. And that's 60 devices in that classroom and 60 devices in this one and 60 and six. Look at how many devices we need to support. Before it was like, I just need to support 20 total. And now I need to support like 600 or different devices. So now this is a capacity issue. I need to support more wireless clients. And so really what's going to happen, fortunately these days our access points are able to, especially Cisco's access points. And these days, let me get a thought out. Back then it was about 25 devices per access point. Now we can support a whole lot more than that, like in the 60 to 80 range. Um, due to all the new protocols and better hardware and such. I mean, it's been 15 years. I would hope it'd be better. And so what we're going to do probably is put one access point in every classroom. And so we're doing this a little bit more of a micro cell concept where we're, we just want a very small coverage gap. And maybe we'd put a couple of devices out here in the hallway too, just to, to kind of make sure that we're covering ourselves this way and that way. Um, but, but we've changed the way we do wireless designs and that, based on that. A um, couple other things you might need to know. Uh, for example, this concept right here, you know, I'll just draw it out again. So now we've got two access points and we need to, um, you know, figure out how far apart they should be. And so if I were to draw a design like this, well, look, there's a pretty big gap in there that as you walk across, you might, you know, from one access point to the other access point, you might lose, you might lose coverage. Okay. So now, uh, whoops, hold up. Okay, so here's one access point. Here's another access point. Now, let's make sure that they touch. Okay, now they're touching. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, it, you know, if you look on paper, okay, I shouldn't lose, you know, I shouldn't lose any uh, throughput as I walk from one access point to another. But at the same time, we do need to be able to talk to both of the access points at the same time. Because if I'm going to roam, if my client is like, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to connect to that access point. That one's bad now. I need to talk to both at once and say, hey, I'm leaving. Um, and hey, I'm joining you. Because there is, you know, gratuitous ARPs and things like that that need to go out in order to keep my uh, session active. And so that's not good enough either. So what we typically recommend is overlapping. And specifically, this overlap either needs to be roughly 20% in a typical environment or 35% if my environment involves voice over IP. So if I'm expecting to do phone calls, which I would argue these days, more often than not, we're expecting to be able to do a Wi-Fi call uh, of some kind. You know, back again in my day, it was, you know, you'd actually have Wi-Fi phones, <laughs> with voice over IP phones that you'd carry around. Um, but so for the most part, we want, you know, somewhere in here between 20 and 35%, but we should be looking at 35% overlap for, for voice calls. Um, we also need to know, okay, we draw these circles, but what does that circle represent? Well, a circle represents a particular signal strength level and our signal strength um, is being managed or being measured in what we call DBMs, okay? The DB stands for decibel, decibel, and the little M stands for milliwatt. The decibel is an interesting way of measuring things because it's a relative measurement system. And it's always relative to a particular value. In our case, DBM means that we are relating the decibels to a milliwatt. So um, 
and and then it also reads exponentially from there. And I, I <laughs> I'm like I'm wanting to like go into the details of all this because it's it's fun math, um, but unfortunately we just don't have time for that. So when we're looking at measuring decibels, there's um, really I'm trying to decide if I should. I'll give you the value, a couple of values. You know, negative 72 dBm is was traditionally how we would measure a wireless signal. This would get us um, tolerable. It would, be, it would basically say, okay, you're going to connect at negative 72. Um, and then for voice, we'd say it'd need to be negative 67. It's negative because it's less than a milliwatt of power, by the way. So anything less than zero is less than a milliwatt. Anything greater than zero is more than a milliwatt. Again, it's a relative and exponential. Uh, way of measuring. So all that to say though, if you want the best of the 802.11ax wave, not wave, um, Wi-Fi 6 connectivity, then you're probably still going to want to see this into like the negative 55 range to negative 60. Uh, we might be able to do negative 62, but this value, you have to kind of decide what that value is going to be from, you know, what the threshold is that you're going to accept. And uh, from there, you're just going to have to uh, do your site surveys and figure out, okay, um, I'm going to draw this. Maybe this is going to be negative 65. And so I draw my rings on the map at negative 65. And then I make sure that I have about a 20 to 35% overlap there. So I don't know that Cisco is going to ask too many detailed questions about this on the exam, but just be aware of, um, uh, be aware of some of these concepts. So unfortunately, we are out of time. We don't have the ability to go into detail on location services. Uh, the gist of location services, um, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just give kind of a, a dialogue here, a monologue here about it. But, oh, that's our agenda, wrong button. Uh, <laughs> from a location tra tracking perspective, we can basically track any Wi-Fi device. So there are two concepts to that. One would just be tracking the devices that people use. So whether that's a phone or a laptop or what have you, but also we might want to tag devices. So you can buy a little active RFID tag, they call them, that's actually, it's got a battery in it. It's communicating Wi-Fi up to the access points. And so we can attach those, you know, hospitals love to attach these to wheelchairs and IV pumps and uh, resources and assets that are hard to find at you know, when you really need them the most. Um, we also want to prevent them from walking off. And so you can use a concept called geofencing and you can build a perimeter around the hospital that if a wheelchair goes off of the front I pickup area, I guess I'll call it. I was going to say the front porch. That's not the right word for a hospital. But, you know, if a wheelchair starts to leave the premises, then a, a security alert goes off on the uh, uh, for the security officer and they can run out to the parking lot and make sure that whoever's wheelchairing, you know, pushing a patient out there is um, is not just going to fold that wheelchair up and fold, put it into their uh, car. And so there's a lot of different ways we do that. Cisco um, supports this. All we need are access points and wireless LAN controllers from a hardware perspective. From a software perspective, DNA Center will do this. Um, Cisco has a software package called DNA Spaces that is focused on this. That would be an add-on to DNA Center. Um, but we also have traditionally prime infrastructure and then also connected mobile experiences or CMX is a Cisco product that supports it. Um, our primary way of tracking uh, where devices is going to be using a concept we call triangulation which is looking at the signal strength relative to three different access points and it'll try to pinpoint the location, but you can't always just do signal strength tracking. And Cisco loves this concept of RF fingerprinting as well. RF fingerprinting is simply walking around a building and, and profiling it to figure out, okay, we don't want to assume that everything's in free space. There might be some concrete walls. There might be some other sources of interference. And so we want to know this RF environment as best we can before we start making assumptions of where things are. So if we want to improve the accuracy of our locations, we would want to do a site survey that gives us you know, this concept of RF fingerprinting ultimately. So that's that, that was location in a nutshell. Um, I go into a lot more detail on this on our CBT Nuggets course. For those who are subscribers, you can go check that out or get a free subscription if you want to, uh, free seven day trial is really what I should say um, to go through this. but. Um, you know, I don't expect Cisco to, to really drill us on location techniques and services and such on the exam, but it is on the blueprint and so it is fair game. So just make sure you have a grasp of that. 
So all that to say, for those who missed it at the start, this is our last session for a little while. I'm going to take probably two to three months off. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, I mean, I'm not planning on going anywhere. I want to be back here. I just, I, I've got to have a little bit more time to figure a few things out with uh, content production. And so um, this is unfortunately what's got to go in order for me to make sure I have the time to do that. But once I figure everything out, we've got a good workflow going. I plan to come back and keep going, ideally with Domain 2, because, hey, congratulations, we're done with Domain 1. Uh, we've covered everything there is to know uh, in Domain 1, and we're ready to move on to Domain 2 next time. So with that, I will hang out in the chat for another 10 minutes or so. If anybody's around who, uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to keep punching away at that or pump, typing it into the chat. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you very much for everyone who attended today and who's been watching all of the other videos. It's been a lot of fun going through Domain 1 and um, hope to see you again real soon. Take care.